Good morning. Today's prelude is Sonata in F Major, Kirschel number 332 by Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. Welcome to First Unitarian Church of Orlando. I'm John Brockman, a worship associate, AV team chairman, and leader of the Eclectic Music Collective here at One U. Unitarian Universalist congregations such as ours honor, celebrate, and seek to learn from the universal truths and evolving wisdom within humanity's collective faith traditions. We affirm and promote seven guiding principles as we do so. We affirm the inherent worth and dignity of every person. We affirm justice, equity, and compassion in human relations. We affirm the acceptance and encouragement of our individual spiritual growth paths. We affirm to practice and promote the free and responsible search for truth and meaning. We affirm the right of conscience and the practice of democratic process in our societal endeavors. We affirm the shared goal of world community, peace, liberty, and justice for all people. We affirm continue learning and respect for the inherent interdependent web of all existence for which we are a part. For more information regarding our specific congregation, please visit us at orlandouu.org. You may also contact us via email at Welcome team at orlandouu.org. After service today at 1130, we will enjoy our weekly fellowship where we gather, chat, and share. One of the breakout rooms is the Welcome Center, where you share any questions you have about our community and church. Please note the meeting number and passcode. This information will be repeated and posted again at the end of worship. All are welcome. You are also invited to join Reverend Margalee Balzer on Monday or Wednesday in order of the first letter of your last name at 12.30 p.m. using the link on the screen. Groups assigned by last name as follows. Monday, August 16th at 12.30 p.m. for last name starting with M through Z. On Wednesday, August 18th, at 12.30 p.m., with last name starting A through L. Please consider contributing school supplies to the Joy MCC Food Pantry, one of our Share the Plate partners. The Food Pantry serves hundreds of families each month 
for which your contribution will make a tangible difference. Supplies can be dropped off at 1U in the volunteer space of the Enrichment Center building, weekday mornings through August 20th. Your generosity is greatly appreciated. First Unitarian Church of Orlando has been an extension of home to me for over nine years now. It's become a safe space where I'm grateful and encouraged to practice, share, and challenge my skills for music production, music performance, and audiovisual technical support, all in service of our congregation, our church mission, and the community. I invite you to consider what First Unitarian Church of Orlando, one you, is for you. I encourage you to consider a gift of financial support for One U's varied ministries and efforts in the community and beyond. Whatever you generously contribute, I personally thank you for your support of this congregation and its work. Thank you. This month, we continue our Share the Play program with the Zebra Coalition. The Zebra Coalition is a network of organizations which provide services and support for the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, gender nonconforming, and cisgender youth community ages 13 through 24. The Zebra Coalition assists young people facing homelessness, bullying, isolation from their families, physical, sexual, and substance abuse challenges, all with individualized programs to guide them towards recovery and stability. Please consider your generous support via an offering. Please do so in support of the many ministries and community partners of this congregation. To do so, go to orlandouu.org and click the Donate button in the upper right corner. You may also send a text or send a check. I'm grateful for the honor and the opportunity to welcome you to our service today. Now, let's gather to seek, share, and discover together. Welcome all. Blessed with love 
and amazing grace when our heart is in a holy place. When our heart is in a holy place. Our call to worship today is a call to open our hearts, minds, and spirits to whatever might come when we take time to just be. Our theme for August is holy, holy, slowly. So today, our worship service invites you to simply be present. Doge reminds us through these words, since there is nothing but just this moment, the time being is all the time there is. In our story today about the mole and the boy discussing all kinds of important things, they note that breathing is key. So let's try that. Let's begin with a few breaths, knowing that three cleansing breaths often open our vagus nerve, which releases tension throughout the body, making space for the sacred to enter. And I know that sacred may not be your word, Your word might be the universe, holy, spirit of life, the divine. Use your breath to simply bring spaciousness for the spirit to open. Together, I invite you to breathe in, to feel the breath moving throughout your body, sending the blood flow to your fingers and toes. Pause and breathe out to release tightness allowing it to simply drift away. We breathe in again to fill our bodies, our minds, our hearts, our souls with life. And we pause before breathing out any lingering tension or worry. And once again, we breathe in to spread warmth and goodwill throughout our bodies and pause before we breathe out to create space for the holy, the sacred, the divine, the connection to the universe. And as you now continue breathing in a way that is comfortable, I'd like to read these words from the Reverend Sandra Fees, which is printed in the Skinner House book, Conversations with the Sacred, which was collected and edited by the Reverends Manish, Misra, Marzetti, and Jennifer Kelleher. Cosmic Presence. Ignite me with your energy. Let me be filled with the radiance of suns and stars, rising along morning's rim and setting in the evening's cool. May I be sparked with curiosity to greet whatever may come and accept whatever may go at the end of day. Let me not slip into the routine or be consumed by the mundane. May I be surprised by the lavish blaze of creation so that my spirit may catch fire and be reawakened to delight. See what comes up for you in the next couple of minutes. Perhaps an image, an experience, a wish, a feeling, a dream. I'm going to read it one more time. See if there's a phrase or an image that comes to you. And then we will pause for two minutes. Cosmic energy, ignite me with your energy. Let me be filled with the radiance of suns and stars, rising along morning's rim and setting in the evening's cool. May I be sparked with curiosity to greet whatever may come and accept whatever may go at the end of day. Let me not slip into the routine or be consumed by the mundane. May I be surprised by the lavish blaze of creation so that my spirit may catch fire and be reawakened 
to delight. We're the Allen family and we're here to light the chalice today. So if you could please join us in our usual chalice lighting words. Maybe. In the light of, of truth, truth and in the warmth of love, we gather to seek, to sustain, and to share. Look at that fire blowing. Yeah, it's beautiful. <laughs> Today we will be revisiting a story called The Boy, the Mole, the Fox, and the Horse by Charlie Mackesee. And Louise Christie shared this with you the summer of 2020 when we had our UU Wellspring service. Now this book has been described as a quiet book for chaotic times. And I describe it as a book of the most important things. I'm going to read several lines from it as I find that each page holds a spiritual truth that needs some time to digest. The author says, I hope this book encourages you, perhaps, to live more courageously, with more kindness for yourself and for others. I'll be sharing some of the wisdom exchanged between the boy and the mole. So if you want to hear what the horse and the fox have to say, you might want to take a look at the book. What do you want to be when you grow up? asked the mole. Kind, said the boy. I'm so small, said the mole. Yes, said the boy, but you make a huge difference. What do you think success is? asked the boy. Oh, to love, said the mole. And what do you think is the biggest waste of time? Asked the boy. Comparing yourself to others, said the mole. The boy paused and added, I wonder if there is a school of unlearning. Mole replied, most of the old moles I know wish they had listened less to their fears and more to their dreams. Imagine how we would be if we were less afraid, replied the boy. The mole continued, one of our greatest freedoms is how we react to things. And I've learned how to be in the present. How? asked the boy. I find a quiet spot, shut my eyes, and breathe. That's good. And then? Then I focus. What do you focus on, said the boy? Cake, said the mole. Isn't it odd we can only see our outside, but nearly everything happens on our insides, noted the mole. 
Oh, so much beauty we need to look after, said the boy. Being kind to yourself is one of the greatest kindnesses, said the mole. We often wait for kindness, but being kind to yourself can start now. Sometimes I worry that you will think that I am ordinary, said the boy. Oh, love doesn't need you to be extraordinary, said the mole. And now one last piece of wisdom that I'll share from this book. When the big things feel out of control, focus on what you love right under your nose. What's your best discovery? Asked the mole. That I am enough as I am, said the boy. As we make space for the joys and sorrows of this congregation, I invite you to join in in our communion of names and add the names of those who are on your hearts this morning in the chat, whether they are there due to a joy or a sorrow. Hmm. Send love and positive energy to Bonnie Rich as she awaits heart tests results from her doctor. And to Arlene and Jim Dweller, Jim continues to receive cancer treatment and Arlene continues to deal with several health challenges. May they draw strength from your support. We are saddened by the death of Judy Mohini, who had been a member of this congregation before moving to Arizona to be near her daughter, the Reverend Christine Dance, who herself was a member of this community and ordained here in this church. Some of you may remember her by Christine Haskins, Haskins our sympathy for the family. Also, Joan Nelson, our board president, is joyful to report that her older brother is home from the hospital after being there for 18 days because of open heart surgery. Quite tragically though, and unexpectedly, during this time of concern for her older brother, her younger brother passed away. Surround her with your love and your compassion. Spirit of love and compassion, that of which we are a part. In these uncertain times, in these transformative times, may we all have what we need. And may we even have a little bit more so that we may be of support to another. Let us always remember to engage our fellow travelers on this earth, our dear companions, with compassion, which abounds all around us if we choose to tap into it. May it be so.
I read parts of one of my new found favorite books to you earlier. I know it's disguised as a children's book. Um, it's called The Boy, the Mole, the Fox, and the Horse by Charlie Mackesy. But I saved one of my favorite lines for now when the mole asked the boy, Is your glass half empty or half full? Hmm. I'm just grateful to have a glass, said the boy. Just happy to have a container for whatever is in the glass. Hmm. The glass reminds me of the sacred space we can choose to create. A space where we can open ourselves to the what ifs and what might be's. And even the space for us to open ourselves to the wonder of the universe or the depths of our souls. Half full, half empty. Oh, please, just give me the opportunity to hold space for the water within. You know, we do have a choice of what lens we use to view the world. And for most of my life, I found that I filled every space with teaching, mothering, making things happen, doing things. I kept myself so busy that there was no time to just be open to what my soul might want to say to me. So my answer to Mole back then would likely have been, what glass? Oh, do I have a glass? I didn't even notice. Our spiritual lives can be like that. Who, me? Oh, I have a spiritual life? Oh, no, I didn't notice. Uh, I'm a Unitarian Universalist, you see. So thinking I had any control over a spiritual transformation, that was not even a part of my vernacular. When I thought of transformation, well, I usually thought of like the caterpillar turning into a butterfly, and that is amazing. And it's also an inevitable thing that happens to a caterpillar. No thinking about it required. It's a natural phenomenon. Or I think of transformation as making something new, perhaps refinishing an old desk. This is not an inevitable process. Yet it can be pretty amazing to make something old into something that looks shiny and new. But this takes serious elbow grease, planning, and some expertise. And then there's the transformation of those of us who have changed our weight, our hair color, our clothes, our jobs. These kinds of transformation often take trainers, cosmetics, education, or money to make it happen. We have to do something to make transformation happen. So what does it mean to choose to transform spiritually? Does it happen automatically like the caterpillar to butterfly? Does it require hard work and patience to create something new like the refurbished desk? Does it take professional help to transform our spirituality? Well, I don't think it requires any of these things, even though some spiritual tools can help along the way. I think it's more like holding the glass, and no matter how much water in, is in it, it's being grateful for the glass and being open to what the glass might hold while paying attention to how the liquid inside might swish and spill be stirred, evaporate, be mixed with food coloring, lemons, or spirits. Well, the earthly kind of spirits in this example. Just saying that the glass, the container, remains the same while the water or the spirit can evolve and transform. Now, for us to choose spiritual transformation, the only thing we need to work hard at is being. Just being our authentic selves which for many of us can be confusing, scary, nerve-wracking, or eye-opening. We need to take a first step towards knowing ourselves and connecting deeply with our inner wisdom to see what transformation might occur. And as the boy and the mole discuss, breathing is key.
Now, when we did the brief meditation earlier, whatever came up for you may have been your inner wisdom communicating more directly with you. Carl Jung, the Swiss psychologist, explores the soul by asking each of us to discover within ourselves who we are and to be open to the wisdom that arises. Jung's ideas encourage us to create that holy container that allows us to listen closely to ourselves, to sort out what is our ego or persona, in other words, the part we show to the world, and what we often come to believe is our whole self. Going beyond this outer protective layer of ego and persona can lead you to finding your spiritual center. This doesn't require hard work, and it isn't automatic. It is simply making the choice to be willing to take the time to examine who you are from the center out, to live into being fully by you by being open to listening to your heart and your soul as you learn who you are and how you are connected to the great beyond. Yes, there are tools to help with this. Spiritual directors, programs, coming to services, yoga, But the concept is simple. Be open to connection. Live as authentically as you can. Aiming for spiritual transformation is a choice, one that requires you to slow down, listen to your inner wisdom, and live what you learn about yourself. When you begin the journey, you don't even exactly know where you're beginning and where you will end. Like flowing water, the shore provides a boundary, but the river continues to move. Simply being open to learning about yourself from yourself starts the spiritual transformation. I actually imagine the transformation is starting from a a cluttered interior life filled with perhaps good books, quotes, amazing movies, recipes, computer code, dirty laundry, and a hodgepodge of memories and relationships of past experiences. Amongst these larger items is a lot of junk mail that crowds out the important experiences and distracts me from what really matters in life. And why is that important? To be connected to what really matters in life? To be able to see more clearly who we are at a soul level? To feel deeply connected to, well, use your word, God, the universe, the divine, or the great beyond. Some would say that without this deep knowing, we risk acting out from our unexplored interior spaces, perhaps even from our unexplored shadow sides. When we are short-tempered, when we expect that we are entitled to the best of something when others are not, when we make decisions that we know are not in our best interest or perhaps in our community's best interest, but feel compelled to do them anyway, then we are acting out of a surface level of protection, ego, persona. From the mask of who we really are, we often make choices that are detrimental to humanity as a whole. Now, from our book, Mole, would have trouble with this unexamined life, as it likely does not lead to kindness to yourself or others. Yet when we create the space and take the time to wonder, to explore, to ask questions of our inner selves, we're often surprised by what our souls, our own divine, has to tell us. So often an aha or an insight that was hidden, but now seems so apparent, comes to us. We don't go out and find it. Our quiet, our welcoming, invites this transformation in as our deepest meanings either seep into or burst into our lives. And the big payoff of spiritual transformation? We are more likely to find beauty and joy in our lives. We feel sustained in the work of justice that we take on. We find purpose and meaning and we live into it. And I know these things don't come easy at times, yet once you've chosen to open yourself to spiritual transformation, the surprise might be a recognition of how you are surrounded by a sense of gratitude and far more love than you ever recognized before. 
And now when I see that transformation in someone, my first thought is, oh, I want some of that. So how do we go about this spiritual transformation? How do we get some of that? And maybe you're wondering, as Unitarian Universalists, is there a requirement to believe in God or a divine power? I'll first share my own story to respond to these questions, kind of the long way around. To illustrate the spiritual journey that I am on, about eight years ago, when I was a religious educator at the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Fairfax, I enrolled in a year-long course that our congregation was offering on spiritual deepening, called UU Wellspring, which I have since brought here. I had heard that the year-long commitment was life-changing and that I wouldn't regret being part of it. That was quite the understatement. I was spiritually transformed by the experience. It began with the program requirement of daily spiritual practice. And I was pretty busy at that time in my life, working and parenting a teen and a young adult, volunteering, book clubbing, traveling, much like many of our lives pre-pandemic. So I had no idea how I could actually bring a daily spiritual practice into my life. So I chose chopping vegetables because it was something I was already doing almost every day. So chopping vegetables it was. But as I've I've said before from this pulpit, it wasn't the chopping of vegetables. It was the intention that I brought to the practice that brought the transformation. I first gave thanks for the vegetables that grew that grew into gratitude that I was able to be part of a farm cooperative that brought fresh organic produce to my door year round. And that grew into gratitude for the farmer who planted the vegetables, the truck and the driver who delivered it to gratitude for the time I spent chatting with my family while chopping vegetables. This regular activity became an opportunity to feel deep gratitude on an almost daily basis. In fact, when we went on vacation, and you know how you come home to those two limp carrots in the bottom of the vegetable drawer, I would take them out and chop them to recreate that sense of gratitude that I had been missing while, you know, eating out for a few days. I began to realize that I was somewhat addicted to creating that feeling of gratitude. And when I took some time and wondered why, the understanding that I was becoming more grateful for everything in my life became apparent. This gratitude habit was seeping into everything I did and actually became a part of my lens, my UU lens of looking out at the world. You can read the full story of my vegetables chopping in an essay in the Skinner House book, Faithful Practices, Everyday Ways to Feed Your Spirit, collected by Eric Wickstrom. Now, my spiritual journey of gratitude led me to recognize who and what I was so grateful for and helped me attune myself to what is more important in this life. This lens of gratitude made my experience in life more beautiful. A sense of peace settles on me far more regularly since I began this practice. It morphed into moving beads on a gratitude chain to recognize that I actually do stop to smell the roses, something I would not have done before. I would have barely noticed them. And if I had, I would not have given them much thought. They would have been just the backdrop of my life. And now I realize there is no backdrop. The world and people in it are all interconnected. The web of life now holds a much deeper meaning for me. So I continue in my spiritual practice as it reminds me to value all that is in my world. I would never have guessed that chopping vegetables could lead to this deep sense of gratitude, which led to a deep peace. I consider it one of the greatest blessings in my life. So spiritual transformation can come from spiritual practices. Yet I would never have gotten to a sense of spiritual transformation without a community of people opening themselves to these type of experiences. Coming to UU congregations and interacting with one another as we're all seekers is one way to do that. I've also worked with a spiritual director um, And my first one worked only with people who were seeking spiritual deepening through the expressive arts. I loved her work and wanted to work with her. So I increased my time at the keyboard and even reluctantly journaled as part of our spiritual time together. Creating an hour a month to meet my spiritual director felt like a luxury. I paid her. I cleared my calendar. I found a quiet space. And most challengingly, 
I cleared my mind and entered into an hour of being open to whatever might arise. These sessions showed me how to listen to myself, how to take my inner life seriously, and enjoy what I discovered. Again, UU Wellspring opened a path and pointed me to the tools to begin my spiritual journey. With fits and starts, my spiritual journey continues. Kathy Sherman captures the pacing of spiritual journey in a poem called Deep Well, which is from Joyce Rupp's book, Fragments of Your Ancient Name, 365 Glimpses of the Divine for Daily Meditation. Spiritual transformation generally doesn't happen overnight, although at times a burst of insight floods our souls. So Kathy asks in her reading, How far down into my secret self do I go? How far until I find you whom I seek? How often until I'm saturated with love? Further, always further so it seems. Lower the bucket of prayer into the depths. Slowly bring it forth and taste its treasure. This constant dipping inwardly to the source can be a slow, tedious, and lengthy process. And at other times, the bucket falls without effort, and I draw forth quickly, drink until I am full. For me, these words also lift up the question of whether a spiritual transformation requires a belief in God or the divine, or even a connection at the soul level to the cosmic universe. I believe that spiritual transformation does not require a belief in God or the divine. I believe that we are all deeply spiritual beings and that if we can connect to our deepest selves, that is enough. That discovery can bring our most authentic self forward, which in turn transforms the world with our acts and words of justice and love. And if you do have a belief of a greater love, the divine or God, the more you're in touch with your own divine self, the more you can feel connected to a divine essence beyond yourself to spur your joy in life and your work for justice and love in the world. When I first explored my spiritual life, I saw it as a luxury, perhaps even a bit of a woohoo activity. Now I value the spaciousness and gratitude that spiritual practice and spiritual companioning have brought to my life. My choice to create the space for spiritual growth and transformation has uncovered old wounds and I've been able to make peace with them. As you consider the tools that will bring you spiritual transformation, I hope my story stirs some wonder and questioning within you. Perhaps you're yearning to discover your soul and deepen your connections with the divine universe. So the question is not whether your glass is half full or half empty, but rather, do you recognize that you have access to a glass and that holding it and your life with intention and attention allows the opportunity for spiritual transformation. Spirit of life, may we be blessed with bravery and wonder as we transform ourselves spiritually in both small and great leaps of faith. May our openness to the challenges of living, the joy of connection, and the beauty that surrounds us Sustain our every waking moment. Let the journey begin. There's a river flowing in my soul. 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 
my heart. There's a river flowing in my heart, and it's telling me that I'm somebody. There's a river flowing in my heart. There's a river flowing in my mind. There's a river flowing in my mind. And it's telling me that I'm somebody. There's a river flowing in my mind. There's a river flowing. There's a river flowing. There's a river that's flowing in my soul. Now we'll extinguish our chalice with our usual chalice extinguishing words. Please join us. We extinguish this chalice, this flame. Ah. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. Okay, ready? Yeah. <sighs> Hey. Let's end our worship today with the words of the Reverend Amy Zucker Morgenstern. And every person we meet, especially those who cause us discomfort, we find an opportunity for us to grow, to learn, to go further along the path of transformation that is our purpose in life. Every single one is a teacher. May the next week bring you such moments of meeting that help you become the person you want to be. And may you welcome them with joy. Beloved, worship has ended. And now the service truly begins. Sing in my heart all the stirrings of compassion blow in the wind, rise in the sea, move in the hand, giving life the shape of justice. Roots hold me close.